Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. May we please call Mr. Ryan? Hmm? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Could you please confirm your full name, Mr. Ryan? It's Kevin James Ryan. You should have in front of you a witness statement which is dated the 16th of November 2023. If you turn to the last page of that, which is page 44, is that your signature? It is. And are the contents of that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. For the purposes of the transcript, the URN is WITN 089501100. My name's Megan Miller, and as you know, I will be asking you questions today on behalf of the inquiry. I'm going to be asking you about issues which arise in phase four of the inquiry, focusing on your involvement as an investigator in the security team and, in particular, your involvement in the case study of Angela Sefton and Anne Nailed. But first, I would like to ask you some questions about your professional background. Is it correct that you joined the post office in 1985 as a counter clerk? It is, yes. And is it correct that you are still employed by the post office? I am. Is it fair to say that you've had a varied career over the almost 38 years you've been working for the post office? Very much so, yes. I just want to ask you about some of the roles that you've held. And is it right that in 1997 you became a national field trainer? I did, yes. And do you remember the Horizon system being rolled out during the time you held that role? Um, I'm not sure whether it was before I held that role or... Not, not sure exactly the date it was rolled out, um, but I did use Horizon in that role, yes. And were you involved in training some postmasters to use Horizon? Yes, that was part of the training. And from 2005 to 2006, you were an area intervention manager, is that right? Yes. And can you please give a brief description of what that role entailed? <sighs> It was dealing with issues um, raised by uh, um, a number of uh, sources, branch support, the helpline, uh, retail line managers. Um, I worked for a retail line manager and they would send me issues in a branch. Could be anything from customer complaints um, and it would be a case of trying to resolve any issues in branches for the retail line. In April 2010, you were appointed a Horizon Migration Manager for a short time until yeah. August 2010. Yes. Is that right? And at the end of 2010, is it right that you were initially going to take redundancy, yes. um, but you then saw the security team advertising vacancies and decided to apply? Yes. And what motivated you to apply for a job in the security team at that point? I wanted to stay in the post office. Um, unfortunately, um, the role I'd previously had as a sales manager wasn't something that I enjoyed. So I decided to leave rather than continue in that role. Um, when the security manager role came up, I thought it was um, appropriate to my skill set. So I applied for it. And is it then correct that you joined the team as a security manager in January 2011? Yes. And for a six-week period in July 2013, did you temporarily step up into a security team leader role? Yeah, the team leader that was um, my team leader um, left the post office and I was asked to stand in temporarily until they either appointed somebody or um, due to restructure, they were not going to replace that person, so they would shrink the team, uh, the number of team leaders, sorry. And who was that? Who was your team leader? At that point, it was Keith Gilchrist. Moving on then, please, to the structure of the security team. Yeah. Is it correct that when you joined in 2011, the physical security team and the fraud and crime investigation team merged? Yes. And at that time, there were three teams um, responsible for three regions in the UK. Yeah. North, Midlands and South, is that right? Yeah. 
each team at that point had approximately 18 to 20 security managers, is that right? Mm, I think so, yes. I can't exactly remember the numbers too clearly, but it was larger than the team is currently. And um, you explained in your statement that over the years, the size of the team has decreased. So now there are eight security managers and one team leader in total. Yes. Is it, you've told us that when you became a security manager, uh, you reported to a team leader. Yeah. Is that correct? And the team leaders uh, you remember were Leslie Franklin, Keith Gilchrist, Simon <coughs> Hutchinson, Helen Dickinson and Simon Talbot, is yes. that right? And then when you became a team leader temporarily in 2013, you reported to the senior security manager who you remember being Andrew Hayward. Yes. And when you were a team leader, is it correct then that you had three or four security managers reporting to you? Yeah, it may have been five. I'm not exactly sure of the number. And the security managers you recall reporting to you were Mike Stanway, Steve Bradshaw, and Robert Daly. Is that right? Yes. And you explain at paragraph 11 of your statement that you don't recall providing any in-depth supervision to those security managers. Is that right? Uh, not a great deal, no. I'm, that I can recall, and I've checked with Post Office HR, I think I was only in the role for about seven weeks, maybe a little bit longer. Um, so, really speaking, it was literally just a stopgap to fill a role while uh, uh, replacement was sourced. But you did remember doing some of their performance reviews and conducting one-to-one -one um, meetings, is it that It was right? one-to-ones, yeah. I did some, some one-to-ones with some of them. And you go on later in your statement at paragraph 28 to explain that team leaders regularly provided supervision to security managers conducting criminal investigations. Did you provide supervision in that respect? No, I didn't really have the experience. So anything to do with the fraud side of things was done by one of the other team leaders because I was only standing in and I'd only been there in the team for just over two years. I didn't really have the experience to supervise on fraud. So one of the other team leaders managed your the security managers reporting to you in respect of fraud, yes. is that correct? And who was that? I seem to think it was a lady by the name of Sharon Logan, but I'm not 100% sure on that. And can we please have um, a document with the reference Paul 00127137 on screen, please? So this is a one-to-one -one meeting record between you and your line manager at the time, Simon Hutchinson. Um, at page two, if we could have a look at that, please at the bottom of the page. The very bottom of the page, um, I think it's a comment from you saying, glad to be back in my old role and an area and a job I enjoy. Team leader role was simply not for me, but will fully support Simon in that role. Can you explain why um, you didn't think that the team leader role was for you? <sighs> Throughout my career, it's, I've been working in the field, um, being uh, desk job, I just didn't feel comfortable with it. Um, I also, and also the, the the pressures that were on that role at the time. Um, I just wanted to get back to doing what I know. And moving on then to the training you received yeah. when you joined the security team. That document can be <coughs> down. Thank you. In your statement, you say that when you joined the security team, you'd been working for the post office for 26 years, but you hadn't gained any experience of investigations. Is that correct? Yes. Did you have any knowledge of criminal law? No. And after you were offered the position, you went on a residential training course, which lasted three weeks. Is that correct? Yes. And you remembered this training being delivered by two Royal, Royal Mail security managers called Paul Whitaker and Paul Southern, is that right? Yes. Do you remember any lawyers being involved in delivering this training? Not in that training, no. And could we have the document reference Paul 00129182 on screen, please?
And so we can see that's investigation workshop feedback. Um, and is that then the residential training course? Yes, it looks like yes. And we can see underneath the title course content, the topics covered on the course enable the focus to be centered on interviewing suspect offenders and witnesses, the cognitive witness interview process, searching and notebook entries. Detailed training was provided in those areas. Additionally, training was provided in, in respect of RIPA, Safe Systems of Work, and PORA. What do you understand that to be a reference to? I can't remember. No, I can't, I can't recall what that one is. MPA forms, notes of interview, tape summaries, and offender reports. Are those the things you remember being covered? Yes. Thank you. That can come down. And... You explain at paragraph 45 of your statement that you believe you would have learned when to seek relevant evidence from third parties and about your disclosure obligations through mentorship and shadowing. Is that yes. right? Um, does that mean that you don't remember receiving training on those topics? I, th it was, I would say it was probably on the job training. So as you were going through things, the mentor would talk you through um, how to deal with certain things. Um, I don't remember it specifically, no. And what did the mentorship and shadowing involve then? Um, basically, initially when we start, when I started, sorry, um, I would only be involved as second officers for a number of months. Um, so shadowing the mentor mostly. Um, and then eventually I would be allocated some cases um, and the, the mentor would take me right from start to finish right through the cases and uh, making sure that I covered all the um, relevant points that need to be covered. And your mentor was Steve Bradshaw, is that right? It was, yes. And how long was the period of on-the-job training before you were able to take on investigations on your own? I think I got my first lead. Well, you never really took them on on your own. You always had somebody as a second officer, which nearly always was Steve Bradshaw. But my first case as a lead investigator, I think, was in late 2011. And at paragraph 29 of your statement, you refer to the fact that even after you started undertaking your own investigations, that Steve Bradshaw attended interviews as your second officer. Yes. And for how long was that period of time where he would attend interviews uh, with you? Probably until we really stopped doing full investigations and um, we were a very small team so um, myself and Steve Bradshaw lived relatively close so it was easier to always be work together. And was that in 2013? Yes. Then at paragraph 48 of your statement you say that Cartwright King solicitors started to deliver training in 2013. Uh, do you know why they started running the training at that point? I don't know the reason behind it, no. Um, they did run a number of courses, usually once a year, uh, for a few years. Can we please have Paul 00129310 on screen, please? So this is an email from Dave Posnett to you and a number of others, um, dated the 22nd of March 2013, and the subject is Cartwright King Training Day. So if we scroll down just a little bit, please. Um, there's a list of proposed topics, um, which includes awkward interviewees, significant statements, points to prove, interviewing techniques, defence solicitor role, pre-interviewing slash caution, and borrow versus dishonesty. Do you remember at attending that training? Yes. And what was your view of the training delivered by Cartwright King? Um, obviously, as a relatively new security manager, any kind of training was useful. So, yeah, I found it useful. Thank you. That document can come down. And do you remember receiving any other uh, refresher training during your time as, as security manager? We did um, sessions when we had team meetings on various aspects of the role. Um, I can't remember anything specific other than the Cartwright King days. So moving on then to the guidance which was available to you relating to the conduct of criminal investigations. 
Um, the inquiry provided you with a number of um, policy and guidance documents, um, which you list in your statement at paragraph 19. And could we have to the end of that list on screen, please? It's page 10 of your witness statement, which is WITN 0895010. And is, if we could just go down to the end of that list, please. So in your statement, you say that you don't recognise the first 21 documents we provided you with. So is it correct, then, that you do recognise the final four in that uh, list? Yeah, I've probably seen them, yes, at some point. Thank you. That can come down. And could we then please have Paul 0012... Two five five seven on screen, please. So at the bottom of page one, we can see this is an email from Rob King, um, and you're CC'd in, and it was sent on the twenty first of July, twenty thirteen and he's sending through the draft case review policy and key points document. And if we go then to the top of that page. So we can see this is an email from you to another address which appears to be in your name. Um, is that your personal email address? It was at the time, yes. I think you explain in your statement that you sent policies to your personal email to enable you to print and review them when you were working away from the office, is that correct? Yes. So do we take from that that you couldn't access those documents from your work devices when you were away from the office? You can, could access them, but couldn't print them when you were away from the office. You could only, because it wouldn't connect to a personal printer. At that time, we weren't allocated work printers at home. So the only way to print something off at home was be to send it to my own address, email address so that I could print it at home, so I could be able to read it. So you could access them remotely from your work device? Yes. You just couldn't print it? Just is couldn't that right? print it. Thank you, that can come down. And where do you remember the policy and guidance documents um, being stored? I would imagine they'd have been on a database that we had access to. So if I could turn then, please, to casework compliance. Um, the inquiry has provided you with a number of emails from 2011 from David Posnett relating to casework compliance. Is it right that compliance checks were introduced shortly after you joined the security team? Yes, they were. And what was your understanding of the reason those checks were introduced? I think they just wanted uniformity in the way case files were put together so that everybody was doing anything, everything in there standard fashion. And did you understand that there had been a problem with that before? Um, no, it was mentioned that it had been something that had been done in the past with previous um, investigation managers. So they thought because we had so many new people, it would be worthwhile running again. And so one of the documents which Mr. Posner asked recipients of his email to familiar familiarise themselves with was the identification codes document. And this is a document which you comment on at paragraph 58 of your statement and you refer to as a disgrace. And the inquiry is familiar with this document and I don't intend to display it on screen, but do you know the document I'm referring I to? I do, yes. And does it remain your position that you don't recall ever having seen this document before? No, I don't. And can you think of any reason why you wouldn't have seen it, given Mr. Posner asked you to familiarise yourself with the documents attached and you were fairly new to the team? Um, I'd never really used identity codes, so it's not something that I was familiar with anyway. I mean, I may have opened the document, but I wouldn't have read it in depth. Um, but I can't recall whether I did or not. So you go on to explain in your statement that security managers used identification codes for reporting offences following prosecution, and these were recorded using the MPA01 form at interview and MPA02 form at conviction. Is that correct? Yes. 
And could we have a document reference Paul 00118374 on screen, please? So this is a blank um, MPA1 form. If we could go to the top of page two, please. So we can see there's um, a number of options for recording ethnic appearance. Are those the identification codes you're referring to? That's the form we used, yes. Can you remember using any other identification codes? Um, if we, with, with physical security, sometimes we get police reports that would have them on. Um, so if I didn't know one, I would use um, Google to find the latest ID codes. That's how I would refer to it. So rather than using the post office documents? Yeah. Um, so if, the only, if there were only those identification codes documents being used by the post office, can you think of any reason why Mr. Posnett would have circulated a separate identification code document? I don't know. Thank you. That document can come down. So I'd like to move on to ask you some questions about the involvement of post office investigators following the identification of an apparent shortfall at audit. Mm -hmm. So who made the decision to commence a criminal investigation? Um, so far as I can recall, the cases were raised by team leaders. Um, later on, it may have been the casework team, but as far as I remember, it was team leaders who made the decision to commence an investigation. And when you were a team leader in 2013, uh, do you remember what, what factors you would have considered in raising a case? No, because again, I didn't really raise that I can remember. I didn't raise, raise any cases. It was done centrally at that point. Um, but again, possibly by another team leader. So it, what, it wasn't your responsibility to raise a case whenever mm. you became Due to the experience, leader. no. At paragraph 36 of your statement, you explain that you believe the level of loss required changed over time. Can you explain what you mean by that? Um, I think once everything started to reduce with regards to investigations, the team got smaller. I think they didn't start looking at criminal investigations until the value. It started to increase before they'd start looking at it. Um, well, I can't remember any deta exact details, but I did hear that they were looking at different figures at different times. And when you refer to value, do you mean the, the size of the law? Yes. At paragraph 31 of your statement, you explain that if a significant shortage was reported during a routine audit, your team leader may ask you to attend to begin investigating the issue as an open inquiry. Can you please explain what an open inquiry is? Uh, that's just uh, an initial inquiry to find out the facts of what's happened before any decision is made um, on whether it would go to a full investigation. So that was a step before yeah. a criminal investigation being commenced? Yes. And at paragraph 32, you explained that you might also be asked to attend an audit which was going to be raised due to suspicious activity. Yes. And can you help us with what you mean by suspicious activity? Um, Chesterfield, the admin centre in Chesterfield, they may have noticed some suspicious transactions going through or cash management might have raised an issue with cash not being sent back um, when the, the branch is holding an excessive amount of cash. Um, so under those circumstances, we may have been aware of an audit taking place um, that may result in a shortage. So we may be asked to attend on the day. And you explain in your statement at paragraph 37 that where there was prior notice of a potential shortage which resulted in an audit, the security manager would speak to the necessary individuals in the post office at the outset. Yeah. So who would that include? Um, the auditors usually and um, the postmaster or the staff member um, who's on site at the time. And would those individuals be contacted in every case? Um, if, yeah, I would, yes, eventually, yes. Yeah, sometimes a postmaster might not be on site, so you'd have to contact them by phone. And you go on to say that all relevant data would be obtained. Uh, what would that include at that point? Um, well, obviously, the audit would, auditors would run off horizon logs, um, cash declarations, etc. Um, and eventually they would produce an audit report, so all of those documents would be uh, passed to the lead investigator. 
And what tools were available to you as an investigator um, to investigate that information you've been provided with? Tools as in? Um, transaction data or any requests that you could be make for further evidence? Right, yeah. Um, obviously, we had access to different types of data, such as Credence, Horace, um, ARC data as well. And how did you just decide which type of transaction data you would request in a certain case? It varied from uh, in different circumstances. It depends on the circumstances. Whether you would, I mean, Credence was virtually downloaded on every occasion. Uh, Arc data, occasionally, sometimes. Um, it just depended on the facts of the case. With regard then specifically to ARQ data, what circumstances would you request ARQ data? I think I only ever requested it on one or two occasions. Um, certainly high value losses later on, as obviously as um, horizon issues became more prevalent than uh, under those circumstances as well. And you explain in your statement that you vaguely remember a case you worked on in Newcastle yeah. where a sub postmaster had attributed a shortfall to Horizon and you requested two months worth of ARQ data. Yes. Did you request the ARQ data because they'd attributed the shortfall to Horizon in that case? Um, it was requested because my line manager at the time asked me to get the data to basically rebuild the account. Uh, over two months uh, to see if we could find any evidence of um, transactions that were out of sorts, out of place. So is it correct that you remember going through the data yourself to rebuild the accounts? Yes. And do you believe you had the necessary expertise to interpret the ARQ data? Probably not, if I'm being honest. Um, I did manage to rebuild the accounts. Uh, everything seemed to balance on that occasion. Um, but I've never had any training in going through our data at all. Would you personally be able to have recognised a bug or an error with Horizon from looking at the ARQ data? No. And you say that as far as you recall, Fujitsu would not have gone through the data in this case? Uh, not that I am aware of, no. They would just provide the data. And was there a reason why they wouldn't have gone through it? Uh, I'm not aware of you go on to say then you're unsure if Fujitsu went through the data in any other case, is that correct? Yeah, I wouldn't be aware of that. Would you not have expected Fujitsu to be asked to go through the data given it was their data that they were providing? Looking back, probably, yes. Do you remember there being a limit on the number of ARQ requests which could be provided by Fujitsu? There was a limit on the number of free ones, yes. And do you ever recall being told you could not have ARQ data because of those limits? No. Could we please have Paul 00167369 on screen, please? So this is an email from Graham Ward to you and a number of others, and it's dated the 14th of April 2011, and the subject is Credence versus Fujitsu. And the body of the email says, all, if anyone has any evidence of disparities between Fujitsu and Credence transaction data, please get in touch for example, timing issues, session numbers not matching for postage, label transactions, etc. Do you remember there being disparities between the Fujitsu and the Credence transaction data? I've never had an example of that, no. Did this email cause you concern when you received it? Uh, no. I mean, I'd only been in the, the role for two months, so I wasn't really aware of any issues. Do you remember any further discussion about that issue at the time? No. Thank you, that can come down. So you also explain in your statement that as part of the investigation, any activity would be recorded on an event log. Again, is that by the security manager? Uh, yeah, the person who was running the case as part of the case file. Um, there was an event log that every, every action you took, you would list. And were entries made throughout the investigation or just at a specific part? 
throughout our, the Irish Corps. And what, was that from 2011 when you joined the it security team? It may have started team? a little bit after that, um, but I certainly did use event logs a lot. And is it correct that you were also involved in conducting interviews as a security manager? Yes. So at paragraph 59 of your statement, you explain you recall a new set of interview questions were provided to security managers in 2013. Yes. And can we please have Paul 00031005 on screen, please? This is the conduct of criminal investigations policy, which is one of the documents you were provided with. And if we just go to the bottom of the page, please. Um, we can see just at the very top right, it's effective from 29th of August, 2013. Yeah. If we could go to the bottom of page 16, please. Just starting at um, paragraph 5.11.6, it says, should the recent second site review be brought up by a suspect or his representative during a PACE interview, the security manager should state, I will listen to any personal concerns or issues that you may have had with Horizon System during the course of this interview. It goes on in the next paragraph to say, the following three areas need to be covered in as much detail as possible at an appropriate point during all PACE interviews, regardless of whether Horizon is mentioned or not. Where the case clearly has no link with Horizon, for example, theft of mail, then you must gain authorization from your line manager to proceed outside of this process. So we could scroll down just a bit further. We can see there's three topics, training, support, and Horizon. Are those the new questions you're referring to? Yeah, we were sent those on uh, an email um, and obviously they've been incorporated into that. Thank you. Can we please have Paul 00160044, please? So this is a document we will come back to again later, but um, it's a record of a case file governance meeting which took place on the 31st of July 2013. And we can see that you're present. Yeah. And if we look at the fourth point in that document, please. It says, produce template to assist security managers for investigation interviews, questions to include sub postmaster training, induction support. Um, and we see your initials as one of the leads beside that point. Um, are those the new interview questions? Yes. Um, the initials are the people that the action was given to. However, that was not drawn up by myself. It was drawn up by a lady called Sharon Logan um, because the email that I've got with that on has come from Sharon. And... Were you involved in drafting then the new questions in no. the policy document? No, not at all. So what questions are those referring to that you... They relate? are those questions. It's just that that action was actually transferred to somebody else. OK, so even though it says that you're one of the leads, that's incorrect? It's incorrect, yes. Okay. And thank you, that document can come down. And do you remember the reason why those new questions were introduced? Um, I think it came after the second site report. That's when it was drafted for us to use as at interview. And why did you understand second site prompting um, new interview? Um, I think they just wanted to cover the bases with regards to questions about it. So make sure that they've asked about the training, the support that the branches have been given, etc. Was it because you understood there had been a problem with that previously? With? With covering the bases in terms of training and horizon um, issues and interviews? I don't think so, no. And you explain at paragraph 59 of your witness statement that when the new interview questions were introduced, if a sub postmaster raised issues with horizon, investigators would have to report this in the case file. That's the way I understood it, yes. And that an investigator also had to request ARQ data for the relevant period. Yes, as far as I remember. 
do we understand from that that these weren't explicit requirements before 2013? I don't remember being told explicitly to do that in the past, no. Could we have um, your witness statement on screen, please, at the bottom of page 43? Page 43 and paragraph 97. So you say, following the introduction of further questions to be asked to sub postmasters in an interview relating to the Horizon system, I believe that I would have considered a challenge to the integrity of Horizon in one case to be relevant to others. We had to ask them in all new cases going forwards. I cannot recall if I would have thought the same from when I started in 2011. So is it your position that before 2011, you don't know whether you would have thought that one Horizon case might be relevant to another? Uh, no, I don't think that's particularly clear. Um, if there were issues with Horizon, then yes, it would always have been relevant to other cases. And is that your position even before 2013? Yes. Yeah. So at all points when you were a security manager, you would have thought if, a challenge would have been relevant to another case? If we'd have been aware of anything, then yes, it would be relevant, of course it would. And when you say aware of anything, do you mean aware of a bug or aware of an allegation? What do you mean by that? Uh, yeah, aware of any bugs in the system that would affect balancing. And what about if there was allegations that the Horizon system was at fault for a loss? Um, well, obviously, that would need to be looked into. Thank you. That can come down. Is it correct that following the interview, the lead investigator would complete a report which was reviewed by the team leader before being passed to the legal team? Uh, yes, unless he had any further investigation to do before he completed the case file. Um, but eventually, the case file would be passed to uh, the team leader then, and then on to the legal team. And that case file would contain a report which is sometimes referred to as an offender report? Yes. Who then made the decision to proceed to prosecute someone? That would be the legal team. So you say in your statement that at the end of the offender report there was a conclusion section mm -hmm. um, where a summary could be provided of which offence the facts pointed to, is that correct? Yes. So is that another way of saying that the investigator would recommend which charges they considered to be appropriate? No, just what the evidence showed. But would they um, say the evidence shows this is false accounting, the evidence shows this is theft? Um, can, you, can you just show me the phrase at the end of a report? I just can't remember it. Um, just repeat the, that question I just again, please. Of course, no problem. So in your statement to paragraph 39, you say that at the end of the report, which went to the legal team, I can get that up for you. It's page 18 of your statement. Ah, right, yeah. And you say at the end of that paragraph 39, at the end of the report, there was a conclusion section where a summary could be provided in relation to what the facts pointed to. Yes. And my question was, is that another way of saying that we recommended charges which were appropriate? It wouldn't be recommended. It would be what, um, what it showed, what the investigator's opinion would be. Um, but he wouldn't recommend charges. So would it be, it's my opinion that the evidence shows there's theft in this case? Um, I can't recall, to be honest. Do you think that investigators were qualified to provide a summary of what the facts pointed to in terms of criminal offences? Possibly um, senior investigators, maybe, yes. Obviously, it took time to learn um, those skills. And by a senior investigator, do you mean uh, security managers that have been in the post for a long time or team leaders and above? Probably both. 
So who made the decision then to recover a loss from a sub-postmaster who was being prosecuted? That would be the financial investigators. Did you have any involvement in relation to that decision to recover losses? Not that I recall, no. Could we please have Paul 00105025 on screen, please? So this is uh, sets out the security team objectives from April 2013 to March 2014. If we could go to page 117 of that document, please. Thank you. So are those your objectives for that year? They are, yes. Go to the bottom of that document, section three. So we see the objective is to ensure a robust approach to fraud loss recovery with a return rate of 65%. Do you remember that being a personal objective or a team objective? It was a team objective. Did you personally receive any benefit if that objective was met? Um, not that I recall, no. Okay. Thank you very much. That document can come down. So in the two cases that we will um, go on to touch on in a moment, you explained that you were the second officer in both cases. Is that correct? Yes. Can you just briefly explain the difference between the second officer and the first or lead investigator in a case? Uh, second officer is usually just in attendance at an interview, sometimes at an audit shortage as well. Um, at the interview, it would be around welcome and well, uh, meeting the um, interviewee, uh, setting up the room, um, making sure everything was set up for the interview. Um, you could interject with questions if you felt there was a relevant one, um, but most of the questions would normally be done by the lead investigator. Would the first and the second officer typically discuss um, a case before an interview? Potentially, yes. yes. Um, would there be any discussion afterwards about further inquiries which might be even necessary? Not that I recall, no. Usually once the interview was done, the second officer would step away. If you had a concern in respect of issues raised during an interview or any other aspect of a case, uh, would you raise it with the first officer? Yes. So turning first, please, to the case of Kayam Ishak, who was the sub-postmaster at Birkinshaw Post Office. Um, is it correct that you attended Mr Ishak's branch um, Sorry, Mr. Ishak's follow-up interview with Steve Bradshaw, yes. which took place on the 27th of September 2011. Yes. Were you aware at that time that Mr. Ishak had previously been interviewed earlier that year? Yes. Prior to attending the interview, did you discuss the case with Mr. Bradshaw? Vaguely, I can't. I can vaguely remember the discussions on the basics on the case, yeah. And what did you understand about the case before you attended the interview? Um, not a great deal, to be honest. Um, as I say, the case would al had already been running for a while. Um, I was just asked to come along for the second interview, uh, the follow-up interview. And is it right that you subsequently provided a witness statement in the case exhibiting the interview transcript? Yes. And is it also correct that you attended one of the court hearings in his case? Uh, yes, I did attend. It was more of a learning experience because I'd never actually been to a, a, a live courtroom. So was it for your own experience rather than you were there to provide any assistance? Yes, it was just for my own experience. And did you have any further involvement in this case? Nothing at all, no. So moving on then to the case of Angela Sefton and Anne Neod, who were employed at Fazakerley Post Office. Yep. Could we please have Paul 00113343 on screen, please, at page six? So 
this is a judgment of the Court of Appeal in which the court quashed um, Ms. Sefton and Ms. Neal's convictions along with others. And if we could go to page six, please. Starting at paragraph 23, I won't read the full extract, but I just wanted to highlight the following paragraphs. So at paragraph 23 then, on the 11th of April, 2013, in the Crown Court at Liverpool, and um, before his or her Honour Judge Hatton, Angela Sefton and Anne Neal each pleaded guilty to one count of false accounting with which they were jointly charged. The allegation against them was, in short, that between the 1st of January 2006 and the 6th of January 2012, they had falsified gyro deposit entries on Horizon in relation to the receipt of £34,115.50 in pence in donations made to the charity Animals in Need. So paragraph 25 um, states, Miss Neild was employed as the branch manager in the Fazakirli Post Office, where Miss Sefton was employed as a clerk. Their employer was the sub postmaster, but he was rarely at the branch owing to illness. In 2006, the sub postmaster identified an unexplained shortage of £4,000. He paid half of the shortage and they paid the other half. He told them that from then on, they would be responsible for all losses. Paragraph 26, in December 2011, Santander Bank contacted the post office following a complaint to Santander by animals in need that there was a significant delay between money being deposited in the Fazakirli post office and payment into the charity's bank account. This triggered an investigation. In paragraph 27, the post office audited the branch on the 6th of January 2012 during the audit, 40 gyro deposit slips and a number of check envelopes were recovered from a cupboard which showed suppressed deposits in the sum of £34,219. Miss Sefton and Miss Neild handed the auditor a jointly signed letter in which they said they'd try to repay shortages by using their own credit cards and their holiday money. They had eventually run out of funds. As a result, they began to cover up shortages by delaying the processing of business, de business deposits to Santander and to one other bank. They could not explain the shortages. They had reached breaking point in their lives and health had been deeply affected. Then paragraph 28, on the 20th of January 2012, Ms Sefton and Ms Neil were each interviewed. We'll come back to that interview. Um, then over the page at paragraph 33 then. And the court's conclusion was, in these circumstances, the post office accepts that the prosecution of Miss Sefton and of Miss Neild was unfair and, aff and an affront to justice. Thank you, that can come down. So you explain at paragraph 76 of your statement that the first thing you recall about this case is Miss Neild phoning Steve Bradshaw on the 5th of January 2012, is that correct? Uh, at the time, yes. And is it right that you understood she asked to speak to him outside work about a matter? Yes. What did you understand she wanted to speak to him about? Um, I don't know until the day we went to the audit when Steve told me that they were having balancing difficulties um, and they wanted to tell somebody about it. And why was it Mr Bradshaw that she contacted in those circumstances, uh, do you know? Steve lives in Liverpool, um, so he's probably aware of the office and the staff in the office, so he's probably had previous dealings with them. Um, at the time that Miss Neil phoned Mr Bradshaw, an audit had already been arranged at the branch the next day, is that correct? Yes, due to the complaint made by Santander. So do you understand it then to be a coincidence, the timing of her phoning Mr Bradshaw the day before? Yes, I don't think she wouldn't have been aware that the auditors were going. So is it correct then that you attended the audit of Fazakirli Branch on the 6th of January 2012 with Mr yes, Bradshaw? Yes, I accompanied Steve Bradshaw, yeah. And when you arrived at the branch, the audit was already underway, is that yeah. correct? Yes. So what was your role during the audit? 
Uh, I think Steve took me along just again just for experience um, and to have somebody with him um, in case it moved on to um, searches, which is it, which it did. Um, so he obviously being local, fairly local to Steve, he asked me to come with him because it was fairly short notice anyway. But um, your evidence is that you didn't actually have any kind of active role during the audit? No. And you explain in your statement that you witnessed Ms Neild hand a letter to Mr Bradshaw, is that correct? Yes. Can you describe the circumstances in which the letter was handed to Mr Bradshaw? I can't recall, no. Do you remember if anything prompted the letter being handed over, a question from Mr Bradshaw? No, I don't think so. So you then explained that you were directed to a number of gyrobank deposit slips, is that correct? Yes. And who was that by? I can't remember and recall for certainty. I think it was Ms Sefton, um, but I'm not, not sure on that. So at this point then, had the audit finished? Uh, no, I think it was still ongoing. And was there a reason that you were then directed to participate rather than the auditors? Uh, just because the, I think the ladies told Steve where to find the documents. So there was a conversation with Mr Bradshaw <coughs> during the audit? Uh, yes. Is it correct then that you subsequently attended the searches of both Miss Efton and Miss Neil's homes later yes. that day? Yes. And what was your role during those searches? Just to assist Steve. And you were also present during their interviews on the 20th of January 2012, is that yes. correct? So if we could go then to the transcript of Ms Sefton's interview, please. And the reference is Paul 0044010. We can see that the date of the interview is the 20th of January 2012 and you and Mr Bradshaw attended um, along with Ms Sefton's solicitor. If we could go to page two, please. So at seven minutes and 53 seconds in, it says SB read out the letter. Do you understand that to be a reference to the letter handed to Mr Bradshaw during the audit? Yes. And the start of the letter reads, in 2005, we had a change of computer systems by the post office. It occurred that we had a 4,000 pound shortage. The post office said they would leave the shortage in abeyance for six months so that all work could be checked. Nobody could find the shortage, so the postmaster was asked to pay it back in full. And um, so stopping there, from the documents provided to you by the inquiry, do you know whether the audit was the first time you attended Fazakele branch? No, from the documents you provided, um, I didn't remember them, but I had done a couple of intervention visits there back in, I think it was 2005. Thank you, that document can come down. And if we could have on the screen, Paul 0044222. Thank you. So we can see that this is an area intervention manager visit log. The date of the visit is the 14th of September 2005 and the name of the AIM, so the area intervention manager? Yes. Is yourself? Yeah. So the details of the visit read as follows. The above office has a loss from week 19 of 592 pounds and 21 pence. The OIC states this is something to do with an upgrade of Horizon. Just pausing there, who's the OIC in those Officer in charge. So that would be, I think it was Anne Neil, I think. I think she was the man managing the office at the time. So in that context, an officer in charge is it's the person at the branch? Yes. Not rather than a criminal investigator? No. Um, and 
a problem with the declaration of the cash. There is no error, so I am unable to put it in suspense. OIC is unable to make good as the postmaster on holiday until the 12th of September 2005. Please contact office and reply within seven days. Um, and then the next paragraph says, I attended the office today to find that the loss is now cleared for no apparent reason. The office balanced £1,330 short last week, but this was due to a £1,250 entry with the ATM, meaning that this should straighten itself out on balancing today. This will make a shortage of £80, which the sub-postmaster will make good. Do you remember this visit? I don't. Do you accept looking at that first paragraph? First of all, actually, did you complete the details of visit? Would that have been your entry? Uh, the top half is what, is what would have been sent to me. Uh, the bottom half is what I would have responded with. So what we can see on screen at the minute, yeah, is the, that your entry or someone yeah, else's? Yeah, the above office bit down to please contact office, that would have been pre-populated when it was sent out to me. Okay. Uh, the bottom bit, I attended the office today, that would have been the bit that I would have filled in. And so is the top bit, would that have been pre-populated by Anne Wilde? We can see that. Uh, yes. And do you know who that would have been? I think she used to work in Chesterfield, um, but I'm not 100% sure. But I used to get some of these would come from Chesterfield. So the circumstance is this, that a problem would be reported from a branch to Chesterfield. Yes. Chesterfield would pre-populate part of the form. Yes. Send it to you to go to the to branch. To visit, yes. And then you would provide a, a response. A response, yeah. If we could then just look at the first paragraph, do you accept that from looking at that, the, there seems to be a problem, at least on the face of it, with the Horizon system? That's what they seem to have put it down to, yes. And when you attended the office, you found that the loss had cleared for no apparent reason? Uh, yeah, it may well have been that they've accepted another transaction correction. Because having read all the documents, they used to get quite a few transaction corrections. But you can't tell that from looking no. at this, and you no. have no independent recollection. I can't of it. recall, no. If we could go then to consider Paul triple zero six eight six zero five, please. So this is another log, again with your name on it, and the date of the visit is the eighteenth of January two thousand and six, and the details of the visit say. DUPOF visit. Uh, yeah. What does that refer to? I, had, I, I saw this one, I think you sent me this one last week, and I have no recollection of what DUPOF stands for. I can only assume that there was some work going on at the branch. Um, it could have been disability access or other things that could have been involved with this security <laughs> installation, cameras, etc. Um, but I honestly cannot recall what that visit was about. But would that would you have completed that details of visit section? Yes. Okay. So that would have been your entry, but you can't help us with. What I have it no was idea about. what a Dupoff visit was because it's obviously come out to me with just D U P F D U P O F. So at the time, I assume I would have known what that was about. So I must have been getting a few of those at the time. And then finally, on this topic, can we please have Paul Triple Zero Four Four? Two two three on the screen, please. So this is a third log, and the date of the visit is the eighth of February two thousand and six. And in the details of the visit, we see there's a three thousand nine hundred and fifty nine pound shortage in week forty one. Would that have been your entry? Uh, that would have been again. That would have been pre-populated um, and sent out to me with the details. Uh, I assume um, the branch must have settled that centrally, so it's gone to Chesterfield, so they will have populated it to send somebody out to see if they could assist. So the bottom of that page, please. Didn't catch the in that answer, sorry. Sorry, can you just repeat yes, your, no your problem. answer? Can you just scroll it back down again a second for me? Can we just go to the top, thank you. Uh, yeah, the, um, 
the top part of that would have been pre-populated. Um, I would assume that the um, branches settle the shortage centrally, so it's gone to Sheffield, uh, Chesterfield, um, and they would have pre-populated the form and sent it out as a request to go and assist. Thank you. If we could go to the bottom of that page then, please. Um, we see another box which says current issues. Would that have been your entry, this box? Yes. Which says, I attended the office as they had received a request for payment for the loss sustained in TP09. Chesterfield have now put a temporary block on this awaiting a transaction correction. I have checked all the office documents, transaction logs and event logs for the week concerned and there is no sign of what has caused this loss. I have contacted Gyrobank who are looking to see if there are any errors that have come to light. I have advised the manager that Chesterfield will only allow the block to stand for so long unless they can discover where the errors were made. If not, then the postmaster will have to make arrangements to settle with Chesterfield. Gyrobank have stated that there is no discrepancy showing. Do you remember this visit? I don't remember the visit, no. Um, do you at any point have a recollection of speaking to either the sub-postmaster or Ms Sefton and Ms Neild? I mean, obviously I have visited the branch or I must have spoken to them. I know the postmaster wasn't in branch very often. Um, he left them to run the branch for them, so I would assume I've spoken to one of the two ladies there. Do you accept then that you've said that there's no sign of what's caused this almost £4,000 loss? Yeah, I mean, my role in the visit was to go through all of the documents to see if I could see anything. Obviously, I could only go through what was on hand. Um, so, obviously, I'm not finding anything. I've contacted Gyra Bank. Um, in those days, sometimes we could ring them to try and speed up an error process if they'd had, there had been an error. Um, and then I'd completed this to send it back to where it came from so that they could make further checks. You see, I had no access to any other data. So you would have completed that and sent it back to Chesterfield? Yes. Is that your description? Um, so it, would it have been usual for you to have received anything back from Chesterfield or would it be usual for you to not hear anything mm, it would after be, that? Usually I would not hear anything. Yeah. I was just boots on the ground to go and have a look and see if I could help. Then it goes back to Chesterfield. Would you have been concerned about that situation where you've got a, quite a large loss and no sign of what's caused it? Um, in those days, the problem was a lot of errors took a very long time to come back, hence the shortcut by ringing Gyra Bank to see if they could identify anything, because um, historically Gyra Bank were very, very slow on sending errors back. Um, but that wasn't, I wouldn't say it was common, but it happened where you'd have losses like that. Which you couldn't find an explanation for when you yes. attended. Do you accept that this sounds similar to the loss reported um, in the letter handed to Mr Bradshaw, £4,000 um, loss? It's, yeah, it's similar. I can't, I'm not sure on the timeline how far away from it was from then. Um, so they say it was 2005 and the date of this visit is 2006. Right. At the start of 2006. Um, possibly. I don't know, honestly. Did you inform Mr Bradshaw that you'd attended this branch previously when it was experiencing shortages? No, because I had no recollection of it at the time. Did you ever check your records to see if you'd previously visited a branch you were involved in investigating? Unfortunately, um, as I said to you earlier, that I was decided to take redundancy. So I was going through that process, so one of the parts of that process was to clear my laptop, so I didn't have all those records anymore. So even if you'd wanted to, when you joined the security on. team, you couldn't have checked your records? No. Did you ever ask whether those checks could be made, or think about making those checks? Not that I recall, no. Can you see any potential problems with not making those checks? I mean, ordinarily when an investigation is going on, they would be checking for losses anyway on the branch. But at, in this circumstance where maybe Mr Bradshaw might not have known, can you see any problems with you not having 
independently told him that you'd been at this brunch before? Yeah, obviously if I'd have recalled it, then I would have told him, but I, don't, I didn't at the time. And you subsequently provided a witness statement in this case dated the 21st of March 2012, is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. And that dealt with the audit, the searches and yes. the interview. Did you have any further involvement in this case? Nothing at all, no. Thank you, sir. I wonder if that would be a convenient moment. I don't have many more questions for Mr. Ryan, but if we could have a 15-minute break, please. Yeah, certainly. So, um, 20, what time? What 25 time you, past. 25 past. All right, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thanks, yeah. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ryan, earlier on, I'd taken you to one of the logs where it said D-U-P-O-F. Yes. Um, and you couldn't remember what that was. Does Deprived Urban Post Office Fund sound correct? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, it was basically a, a fund for helping postmasters do branches up, so that that equates to the work that was done in the branch. So obviously the post office are paid or helped pay for some renovations in some way. Thank you. And that's just for uh, completeness. And um, so finally, I just want to turn to ask you some questions about your knowledge of problems with the horizon system. Yeah. And a paragraph 53 of your witness statement, uh, you say, I do not recall ever having any issues or errors with the horizon system being reported to me. We were always assured by the post office and Fujitsu that the horizon system was robust. Yeah. And does that remain your position? Uh, yes. And you also say in your statement that you were regularly informed the same by the post office in your team meetings. That's correct. Can you help us with the names of the individuals from the post office who assured you that Horizon was robust? Uh, it was a, a number of people from the top down. So uh, John Scott, Andy Haywood, uh, and any of the team leaders that I had over, the t over that time scale. So... Um, Helen Dickinson, Keith Gilchrist. Um, I think it always came from the top. I don't know where it came from beyond John Scott, but we were always told it's business as usual, carry on, horizon is fine. And were those oral assurances, written assurances? Mostly oral at team meetings on conference calls. And who um, from Fujitsu assured you that Horizon was robust? I had no, no contact direct from Fujitsu. <laughs> so when you say in your statement, we were always assured by the post office and Fujitsu that the Horizon system was robust? Yeah, the, the, the comments were from John Scott would be that Fujitsu had informed him, etc., etc., and he filtered that down to us, um, that Horizon is robust. So it was something that he was passing on? Yes coming from Fujitsu, yes. is your understanding? That's my understanding, yeah. Could we please have Paul 00094108 on screen, please? We can see this is an internal memo to the Post Office security team from Helen Dickinson, and it's dated the 9th of September 2011. If we go down the page then, please. Um, we can see um, that it discusses a financial investigation which has now been concluded, and the sub-postmaster was reinstated at the branch as there had been failings in the training given by Post Office Limited and he intimated to the auditor that Horizon System had lost data. The contracts manager, Paul Williams, felt that due to these issues, he would have to reinstate with conditions attached, including a full repayment of the shortage. Next paragraph, it says, Kevin Ryan, security manager, discussed the case with Leslie Franklin and Dave Pardo, and it was decided that there was no point in continuing with the investigation. Do you have any recollection of that case? Uh, no, that would have been one of the very early cases that I would have been allocated um, in 2011. Um, from reading that, I would say the contract manager, probably following the discussion with him, 
he decided that there was enough to put the postmaster back in place. So I raised that with my team leader. They decided that um, under those circumstances, we wouldn't proceed with an investigation. Do you accept that on one reading, the reason for his reinstatement and the stopping of the investigation was because the Horizon system had lost data? Um, well, the postmaster has intimated that. Um, I had no information on that at the time. So can you recall um, what information you had? Or I can't, know. Okay. Thank you. And if we it could... It wasn't just, excuse Sorry. me, it wasn't just the um, postmaster saying it. I think uh, Miss Miller's point is that if you carry on reading, the contracts manager, Mr Williams, appears to have accepted it. Yes. So do you know why he accepted it? Not that I can't, can't recall why, no. He's obviously had a, 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 his own discussion with the postmaster. But this is an example, is it not, of a complaint about Horizon apparently being accepted by the post office? Feasibly, yes. Yeah, OK, thanks. Do you remember that when you um, stepped into the role of team leader that the second site report was published around the same time? Yes. What was your understanding at the time of the significance of that report for criminal investigations? Um, again, we were informed that we would carry on as normal um, because they would defend Horizon. So that's what they were telling us. So that's what we were led to believe. So that's what we continue to do. And could we please have Paul 00125273 on screen, please? And this is a profile form and um, it's got your name on it. Yeah. And um, at the top of page nine, then, please. And um, it explains some of the activities that you undertook as the team leader and mentions that it came at an exceptionally busy time when the second site report was published and this resulted in a lot of work being generated around case file governance. Can you help us with the, what that means? Um, John Scott decided he wanted to see every case file. Um, so I was asked to put a spreadsheet together that listed the whole all the active cases so that he could study every single case. Um, and did that just involve you providing him literally with the case with files? With the information, yeah. No, with the information from the case files. It was an Excel spreadsheet, effectively, that had all the active cases on. And were you responsible then for populating that spreadsheet with information from the case files? I don't recall ever populating it. It was just putting the spreadsheet together. As I say, I was surprised to be in the role because it was quite early in my career. Um, so I was just asked to put that together. That tended to be the kind of thing that they asked me to do. And you go on to say um, that you were tasked with putting together the spreadsheet and adjusting it as and when requested by John Scott. Yes. What does that mean, adjusting it um, as and when requested? One of the forms we saw earlier on mentioned that adding certain tabs and lines to add further information to the spreadsheet. And this may be the document you're referring to, but can we go back then to Paul 00166044? This is the record of the case file governance meeting that we looked at earlier. And we've looked at point four already. Could we please look at point seven, just further down the page? So it says, cascade to security managers requirement to censor emails, particularly with reference to second site review slash horizon and any personal slash opinionated comments that could become public slash requested under the Freedom of Information Act. Similarly to earlier, we see that your initials beside the lead for that point. 
Can you help us with what that means? Um, basically, that was a message from John Scott um, and the other senior security managers, um, and that was to be passed on to you, the members of your team. And what was it that had to be passed on? The, basically, the message that is in within that information there. And when it says the requirement to censor emails, is that censor, censor, remove information? No, just, be, just not to put any um, comments on around you know, banter, that, that, that type of thing that you, you would get between security managers, like people do in a workplace. So it's just to be careful what you're putting in emails regarding second sight. Can you help us with what kind of banter there was going around at the time that needed to be controlled? No, just, just, just the everyday stuff, you know, asking, asking people what they were doing at the weekend and making jokes about it. It's just nothing to do with your case files. It was just everything else. On, on that particular point, um, he was asking us not to make too many references to Second Sight. Why did you understand he was making that request? I don't know. I was. I just followed what I was told to do. Did you ever question what you were being told to do? No. Um, point eight then liaison cases. Ensure security managers have oversight and are aware of third party operations in brackets Royal Mail slash police that could impact on the second site review slash horizon integrity. Um, and again, we see your name yep. beside the lead. Can you help us with what that is? Um, yeah, there were a lot of cases that were police liaison cases. So as an example, if a postmaster reported one of his clerks for theft to the police, then we needed to notify the police regarding the information around second site. So that was to provide information about Second yes. Sight to those people? Uh, yeah, we were given a document that we would send, in, in those cases, we'd send out to the police. Do you remember what that document says? I don't, but I'm pretty sure I've probably got it somewhere. Was the, the message in the document that the Second Sight had taken place and was there any undertaking as to the integrity of, integrity of Horizon in that? I can't moment. remember exactly what was in it, but it was just to make them aware of it, is all I can recall. Thank you, that document can come down. Um, so having considered all of those documents and the other ones provided to you by the inquiry, does it remain your position that you don't recall ever having any issues or errors of the Horizon system reported to you? <sighs> Not that I can remember, now. And you explain in your statement at paragraph 14 that the decision was made not to pursue any new prosecutions in 2013. Is that correct? Uh, I think there may have been one or two after then, but I certainly wasn't involved in any. Were you told about the reasons for that decision at the time? Um, they were looking for a new subject matter expert to defend Horizon. And did you understand that there had been an expert previously that they were looking to replace? Yes. And who was that, please? Uh, Gareth Jenkins. Did you have any interaction with Mr Jenkins that you can remember? No. And who told you that he was the subject matter expert? It would have, again, it would have been relayed on a um, team meeting. He would have been mentioned. Um, I know from the documents that you've provided he was involved in the uh, two cases that you raised earlier. But at that point in both of those cases you had no involvement, is no. that correct? So when you say they were looking for a new expert, what did you understand had led them to seek a new subject matter expert? I don't know. I don't, all I know was there was a reason I, why Gareth Jenkins couldn't be used in future. So they were t we were told that um, once they'd found a new subject matter expert, we would continue doing prosecutions. And was that reason explained to you at the time? No. Could we please have um, Paul 00124105 on screen, please, at page three?
This is an email um, from Mark Raymond to you and a number of others. Can you help us with who Mark Raymond is, please? Um, he's the current head of security. And it's dated the 20th of December, 2017. Um, the second, well, the first paragraph says, I just wanted to give you a quick update from the prosecution's meeting. The second paragraph says, a report has been produced externally examining the issues with regard to the group action litigation. Um, did you have any understanding of what that was at the time? No. The last two sentences of that paragraph read, the report has been considered by a specialist external lawyer. Can you help us who with who that was? I have no idea at all, no. Certain findings have been referred back for clarity, but overall there appear to be no major flaws. What did you understand that to be a reference to? I would imagine that's in relation to Horizon. But I'm only, assume, I'm only assuming that. I don't know for certain. Can you remember receiving this email? No. If we go down then to the fourth paragraph, it says, what has been highlighted is the risk of testing a case in the criminal court prior to the civil hearing, where the burden of proof has to be beyond all reasonable doubt as opposed to the balance of probability in civil cases. The risk is that should a trial collapse or a not filthy verdict be reached, this could have a devastating impact on the civil cases. The next paragraph reads, at this stage, the risk appetite dictates that every case will be reviewed on its merits, weight of evidence and public interest as it is now. However, we are unlikely to proceed to prosecute until post-civil action. Did you understand that to mean that there was going to be a pause on prosecutions because of the civil litigation? Uh, yes, I would say so. What was your view of the decision? Um, at the time, I suppose they would know better than I would. So we just accepted that. Thank you, that can come down. With the benefit of hindsight then, do you have any reflections in respect of the way in which criminal investigations were conducted by the post office? Um, yeah, I wish, I wish we'd have been privy to all the facts, because we certainly weren't. Thank you for your assistance, Mr. Ryan. I don't have any further questions for you. Sir, do you have any questions before I turn to the representatives from the core participants? No, thank you, no. I think those are all of the questions for Mr. Ryan, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Ryan, for coming to give evidence to the inquiry and providing your witness statement in advance. I'm obliged to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I think, Ms. Miller, tomorrow is now a non-sitting day and we'll resume on Friday, yeah? Correct, sir. Thank you. All right, 10 o'clock on Friday.